Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Anderson for Medicine and Health, and today we're continuing in our series, actually a 16-part series on long COVID or post-COVID syndrome. So in our first installment, we talked about what a post-infectious illness is and how long COVID qualifies for that, but it has some unique factors around it that make it, um, well, let's just say very unusual. So you can have two people or 10 people with long COVID and they may have 10 different experiences of long COVID. The next thing that I really want to get into is literally this particular um, phenomenon that we have with long COVID where if you look at the medical evidence and you're reading the different papers that come out about long COVID, you can uh, literally get whiplash from reading them because one will be way over here and one will be way over here, one will be over there. And then you'll have commentators, you know, people like myself and other people who look at medical research and interpret it and take a look at it and try and break it down for you. And uh, they may, you know, make more out of one than another because maybe the study was on this was done a little better or worse. And so you can really have this uh, collage effect of a lot of conflicting information. So what I want to do here in this particular subsection, and again, uh, because this is such a massive uh, problem and such a massive topic, I'm breaking this down into 16 short videos that we're going to be sharing over time on long COVID. But I want to really look at four primary papers, resources that have been published in the scientific literature. And uh, if you see me looking down a little bit, it's because I want to make sure that I'm quoting the particular papers appropriately. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm not ignoring uh, the camera or anybody out there. But you have four primary papers. And so one that was very, very uh, well known and distributed came from the very well known scientific journal Nature. And so we'll look at that one. Then another one came from a different paper looking at post COVID and the different COVID variants, which is an interesting paper. Then one that got an awful lot of press when it came out was a paper uh, that said there was uh, no apparent cause. Now, it didn't say there was no long COVID. It just said that they did all these tests and they couldn't figure out what was, what was causing it, which is very frustrating if you're looking for answers as to what to do about long COVID. And then there was, uh, I think, the most recent one in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which basically said that there isn't really a difference between long COVID and other post-infectious illnesses, which we already knew, that's what we talked about in section one, uh, but that is a surprise to people who weren't treating post-infectious illness. And indeed, it's even possible some other post-infectious illnesses are worse than long COVID. Now, if you have long COVID, there's, that's your problem. There's nothing worse than that. Uh, but based on the data and based on a you know, long history of treating post-infectious illness, I would say that they're all very similar in their disruptive to your life. They give you a lot of signs and symptoms and they're just triggered by an infection. But then you have all these other problems. So what we want to do here is go into a quick review of these four papers. So the first one the paper from Nature and on the YouTube channel. So if you're listening on a pod burner, that's great. Uh, on the YouTube channel, I'll, I'll put the references in in the show notes uh, down below. But um, on the Nature paper, basically it says, well, let's be logical. Post-COVID illness looks a lot like other post-infectious illnesses. Okay, that makes total sense. And then they go through a whole lot of scientific debate and scientific history, et cetera, and basically come up with a conclusion that says, we just don't understand post-infectious uh, illness that well. So that's, that sort of ends with a lot of information, but not a lot of direction of where to go. Now, the point I'm going to be making through these 16 parts of this series is those of us who've been treating post-infectious illness for a long time have seen these patterns over and over. And so where the people who wrote the Nature paper 
said, yes, it's like all these post-infectious things, but we don't know much to do about it. That's an artifact of the way that we tend to treat things in Western medicine. So when we get into treatments and treatment strategies, you're going to see that there's a couple of ways of looking at that. And uh, the nature conclusion that we don't know what to do might not be the end-all be-all. Then the next paper was uh, across uh, the variants. So as you know, we had the wild type, alpha, beta, the delta, and Omicron, et cetera. So those are variants. And you can look at uh, the British Medical Journal paper, and it basically uh, splays out, okay, these are more common if you had the earlier variants. These are more common symptoms if you had delta. These are more common if you had Omicron. And you might ask yourself, because I think it's a good question, is there anything that was in common with all of the variants that they, now they look at every variant, but all, uh, anything in common with all of the variants that they looked at? And the answer is yes. The one commonality uh, in all this variation between all the variants was uh, heart and lung issues were found in all of the variants post-COVID or long COVID that were studied in the British Medical Journal paper. <clears throat> now, another one that was um, really interesting to look at as a scientific presentation, in my opinion, a pretty well done study because they cast a very broad net but its conclusions were uh, very uh, interpretable as negative, uh, especially to people who had long COVID, was uh, a paper which uh, I'm going to cause the no, call the no apparent cause paper. And that particular paper um, basically said, we see all of these symptoms in people with long COVID. And we did all of these tests, and they did. They did a large number of objective tests, mini blood tests, a lot of immunologic markers and things that you would normally look at with people with these symptoms and some other types of testing too. But the problem that they came out the other end with is we have these people who are having the problem of long COVID. We did the tests that we felt were reasonable to look at those problems, given the symptoms, etc., and given that we know a, a virus triggered it. But statistically, on the other end, we don't see any difference between the way those lab tests came out, if you had long COVID and symptoms, and anybody else, really. And so that particular paper has actually been interpreted to say, well, maybe long COVID is uh, not a biochemical process, a pathological process. Uh, maybe it, you know, is, is a neurological or neuropsychiatric process, which I can tell you with some certainty there, there's a component of that, but it's certainly not. It is a biological process. Now, you might say, well, how could this paper where they did all these tests, and it's a lot of tests, um, not have found anything in common? Well, if we go back, we talked about this in part one, we go back to the idea of a post-infectious illness. Because the infection is what you have in common, but what the infection does to your body to create the post-infectious illness is different for you often than your neighbor. You both can have post-COVID illness, but the genesis of your problems may be due to a uh, controlling system in the body being thrown off, such as a hormonal system uh, or potentially some of your detoxification systems, etc. So the downstream effects of those give you one set of symptoms. Your neighbor may have more direct damage, and that's where their symptoms are coming. They may have more neurological inflammation and heart inflammation, and so their symptoms are coming from over there. So if I take this big group of people with long COVID, and I have a number of different triggering um, 
processes. So y'all had COVID, y'all have long COVID, but in the middle, the, the triggering process may be different for you versus the other person versus the other person. Your testing is not going to make sense across the whole group. That'd be really great if it did make sense across the whole group because it made it a lot easier for your doctors and for you to sort out, but it doesn't. That's the reality of long COVID. You have one input, which is the COVID infection, but then that can affect the number of outputs. And then that affects the way that you experience long COVID. So because I have a number of outputs affected that give you your symptoms, your labs may be odd and abnormal differently than your neighbor's labs. And if I test a hundred of you, I may come up with some patterns, but I can't say everyone with long COVID in that hundred group is all gonna have this elevation of this marker, let's say, or they're all gonna have this finding on this lab test or this imaging, because it might be different across the groups. Now, in the last couple of minutes that we have here, the last one I wanna talk about <clears throat> is, uh, I believe the newer one, from the Journal of the American Medical Association. And this is the one I call the uh, No Difference paper. And so they had a control group. It was a really well done study. And those control group were not healthy people, but they had, these are people who were sick, but they tested negative for COVID. And then the study group was people who were sick and they had tested positive for COVID. So they both had a post-infectious illness. Just one group had COVID and the other group had something else that triggered their problem. And so the idea of no difference between the groups really came out that if you have a post-infectious problem, it's not likely to be any worse if, if SARS-CoV-2, if COVID caused it, than if another nasty infectious problem caused it. Now, again, this is one of those things that gets interpreted in different ways. So some people look at this and say, well, it's, you know, you're, you're worse off if you had influenza and you got post, you know, post-influenza syndrome than if you had post-COVID syndrome. And again, that's one way to look at the data. But what I take from this is that that particular paper is not saying there's, there's no difference between healthy people and people who had COVID who then have post COVID. It's saying anything that makes you sick from the infectious world that gives you symptoms that are COVID and flu-like can lead to a post-infectious illness and in some cases, other bugs might give you a worse post-infectious illness. Now, one artifact of this is uh, that, and I've got to wrap this up here really quick, but one artifact of this is if you think about the general medical community where, where we say, yeah, there's post-infectious illness, but it's super rare, right? Unless you're somebody like myself where you've been treating it a long time, so you collect all those patients. So yes, it's super rare, but I've been seeing it a lot. Of course, I would say there's not a lot of difference between long COVID and post other infectious illness. There's just specific differences between them. This paper doesn't diminish post COVID. It just puts it into the category of post infectious illness. The problem medically being general Western medicine doesn't have a great way to treat post infectious illness. Now we're going to get into all that other stuff, but we're running out of time here. So I'm Dr. Paul from Medicine Health. Uh, whatever platform you watch me on or listen on, please like, share, and subscribe and do the notifications because when we talk about COVID, sometimes we get really minimized and uh, no one sees what we're doing. Go to dranow.com, D-R-A-N-O-W. There's, there's newsletters on there. There's uh, research summaries, all sorts of things. There are also links to all of my media and uh, links to the YouTube, which will have a deeper set of show notes and links and all of that. But anyway, I'm Dr. Paul for Medicine Health with Dr. Paul Anderson, and I will see you all on the next section.